this is something the Lord been putting in my spirit, and, and uh, as I studied this week, trying to get ready, I, we'll we'll start back in the book of John again, uh, and and I'll just kind of go on with there and go from there. But we was in John chapter four last week, and, and uh, I hope I preach where you live today. You, you, you know, have you ever been to a service and you felt like that the whole sermon was just aimed at you? you ever been there? I have, and, and me being the preacher, I've been there. I thought, Lord, I know you're just talking to me. But, but I, I heard R.W. Shambach say one time, the Lord said this message is just for me, but you can listen in if you want to. <laughs> I, I, Shambach said that. And, and so, but there, there's going to be some crises in your life. And, and, and I want you even now, I'm, I'm going to challenge you right now, even before we start, I, I want you to think about a crisis that could have destroyed you. But instead, God took that crisis and turned it in to a blessing. They tell me that if a pastor is relevant, he can take the message that he's preaching and apply it right in to where we live today. Now, I'm going to assure you that this message today will do that. But we picked up, and I, you don't, you don't, we don't have to read the scripture. Everybody remember the story I was preaching last week about the woman at the well? How many would agree that her life was kind of in a crisis? And, and I want to tell you something else I, that I forgot to mention last week. We talked about why she had had five husbands. Another reason that they could, could divorce a woman in that day and time is if she couldn't have a child. It was legal for the man to kick her out if she couldn't bear a child. Well, that could have got, that could have got Sarah. That could have got a whole lot of different ones if, if they had a chose to. But her life was at a low point. I know it was lower than, than, than you could even imagine. She, she felt like she, she wasn't just an outcast. She was a Samaritan woman. So she was an outcast because of that, but she was an outcast of the Samaritans. She was an outcast of the outcast, so she could, had to come to draw water when nobody else was there. But that crisis brought her to the well at the exact right time when mercy was sitting on the well. So, so, so on, on that basis, I just, I just want to come down through the Word a little bit, and, and I want to look at some people that, that had some crises. But, but the difference, in, it, it depends on which, how many would agree that, that, that on every road you can go, if, if a road's going east and west, you can go east or you can go west on the same road. But it's that is, when you come to a crisis in your life, you can turn toward God or you can turn away from God, and the choice is yours. You can murmur and complain and lose out, or you can th throw yourself totally on the mercies of God. I, I, I wish I, how many have had a crisis in your life? I mean, you, you, you've been through a crisis in your life. Well, and, and, and I, I want to I, I just look at, at some of those. Uh, uh, let, let's look at Hannah, for example. You know, Hannah was in a situation, and, and her husband... You know, he tried to say, well, am I not better than you? Than, well, the answer to that was no. She didn't want how good he was her. She wanted a child. And, and, but in her crisis, she came, and, and I can give you scripture for all this. You know, in, in, in Samuel, you know, where she came there, and, and you would think she'd come to the preacher. You, you know, like you all just came to the preacher. You came to the front. You came to the right place. But, but when the preacher saw they was there, they thought there was something that she was drunk. Because she was so desperate, so she wasn't finding even no help from the priest. But what she did, she let her crisis, the crisis of her being less than a woman, a crisis of having less than what she wanted, but she took her crisis to the Lord, and God gave her the most powerful prophet that none of his words ever fell to the ground because one woman, just, just one woman, somebody like you, that wouldn't take no for an answer, just prayed and travailed till... God heard her prayer, and then she made God a deal. So, Lord, if you'll give me a son, I'll give him back to you, and as long as he lives, he'll be yours. And God did, and she did, and Israel was blessed because of one little woman that had a crisis, and she took her crisis and turned it into a blessing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It, we, we, we're going to get on down to, to some other places here. You, you know, there, there was uh, other people. Let, let, let's look at Israel. You, when the children of Israel 
there was a famine in the land. Of course, God had already prophesied, and, and, and God does some, I start to say crazy things, appearing, appearing to be crazy. He talks to a man named Abraham who has no children and starts talking to him about nation that's going to come up out of him. And then they're going to be taken off into bondage and they're going to serve there 400 years. And you don't, I mean, it's hard when you don't have a child. And let's get real about this too. It, it's easy. Sandy, if you had a need today, I, I, if it's financial, I believe I could believe with every fiber of my being that if you need a million dollars and that had to be done, I believe I could believe for your miracle. And, and, and I believe everybody's that. Well, you can believe for the one on your left and you can believe for the one on your right. You know who you have a hard time believing for? It's not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord. That, that, that's who you have a hard time believing for is, is you. Well, that, that's a, when a crisis comes, it's so easy for us to try to Put it also, but, but Abraham, it was recorded about him. Now, he had a whole lot of warts. He, he did some things wrong, but it's recorded that he believed the Lord, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. But, but God does that supernatural thing, and, and then he takes him. And, and there's something else. A crisis will always be, if it's a real crisis, it'll be beyond your ability to fix it. That's how you'll know it's a crisis. I, I, I mean, you, you know, if you've got $10,000 in the bank and you have an unexpected bill come up for $10,000, you ain't got no crisis. you got a flat bank account now, but you ain't got no crisis. I know ain't got no, it's not good English, but I'm trying to get across where I'm going right here. If you come up, if you got $10,000 in your bank account and you need a million dollars, you've got a crisis. Now, how many know that it, a million dollars, a trillion dollars is no different to God because he owned the cattle on the thousand hill and all the silver and gold that's underneath that. So if it's beyond your ability to fix it, then it is a crisis. But the Lord has the ability and it doesn't make any difference. Let, let's break it over to, well, um, before I get, let, so Abraham believed God and, and, and it was way past anything in the natural could happen. He's 100 and Sarah's 90. Abraham talked about how old Sarah is, and Sarah talked about how old Abraham is. But God supernaturally breathed the breath of life on them, and that nation was formed. And then that nation begins to rise up, and, and, and just like the Lord had said, there was going to be a famine, uh, and, uh, there was a famine in the land, but God had provision through a man named Joseph. I mean, we got to thank God. Lois was talking this morning about before you was formed, in your mother's womb, God had a plan and a purpose. Not any of these crises that you go through will ever take God by surprise. He already knows. So anyways, God sent Joseph down ahead. And then what was a blessing that they, you know, Israel brought his group and they go off down into the land of Goshen, the best of the land they had. So they was in a blessing. But sometimes a crisis comes to move you to your next place. That didn't go over good. I said, sometimes a crisis will come up to move you from this place to this place. Israel, when they went off into the land of Goshen, that was the place where they were supposed to be. And, and, and let me say something else. One reason we stay in a crisis mode for so long, sometimes we get comfortable in our crisis. I'm going to get real whether you do or not. As long as Israel was down there and all the stuff that was going on, they, they were still in the land until finally there got to be a, a, a Pharaoh that rose up that knew not Joseph, and they began to make the burdens harder, and Israel began to cry out unto God, and God heard their voice, and they said, okay, it's time to move. It was God's plan for them to go down there, now it's God's plan for them to come on up out of there. So what's he do? He send, and, and there's another thing. See, God had a plan for Moses' life before Moses was born. During the time that Moses was born, they had a plan for all the men, child. They drowned him. But God had a plan, and his mother hid him and made an ark of the bulrush and put Moses in the ark of the bulrush and let him 
float downstream to be rescued right out by Pharaoh's daughter and then put him in the place of wisdom, the place of blessing, the place of, of authority. You know, he had it going on. He was being raised uh, in line for the throne. But he had something down in his heart that he knew that he was a deliverer. Sometimes you can know something and, and, and still do it wrong. So, so when, when, a, when a, an Egyptian was mistreating one of his, father, his brethren, he come out there and looked both ways, make sure the coast was clear, and took care of him our way, redneck style. <laughs> and buried him in the dirt and thought he got away. He'd come out the next day, and, and then two of his brothers were arguing, and, and, and he tried to call them down, and they said, oh, you're going to just kill us like you did the Egyptian? And so Pharaoh had already heard about it, so he had to go to the backside. Now everything that he had going for him, you all know this story, but everything that he had going for him, all the power, all the prestige, all the education, everything that he ordinarily would have been able to use right there, now he's back on the backside of the desert in God's boot camp. There's some things he needed to learn that he wasn't going to learn down at Pharaoh's house. So back there on the backside of the desert, God sets a bush on fire. And what's God doing? He's keeping his word so what's he have to do? He has to raise up some more crises to get his people moved from here and start them down the road to there. So he sends Moses down and said, let my people go. Pharaoh said no. He said no the tenth time. And the tenth time was not a good time for him to say no. And the Lord dealt with it pretty harshly. So that crisis caused them to begin to move. Not only did they move, they stripped off all their gold, all the silver, everything they had. Now, they wanted Mallory so bad, they was willing to give away everything. You know, God was going to let them go on a trip, and they are going to have plenty of money to stop at Walmart if they needed to uh, on the way out there. So he sends them out with a blessing. So now we've got everything going right. But we're out there, and all of a sudden, there's a, a mountain on this side, a mountain on that side, a Red Sea in front of them, and here comes Pharaoh. Got another crisis. But when they prayed, the Lord said, move forward. God was going to take them forward. The key was they prayed. And the Lord delivered them. But you just find it all through the word. That, you know, there was a crisis. Let's, let's come over into America. Let's come over into the 19th century. There, how many ever heard of a guy named Oral Roberts? Oral Roberts, it, it seemed like all the incredibly great men that God used had a kind of a death sentence on their life. They, they, they went through a time, and so Oral wasn't supposed to live. But God delivered him and used him through a healing crusade that touched literally millions of lives. But what started it was a crisis. The word of faith that's still taught yet today, Kenneth Hagin, senior. You know, Kenneth Hagin was dying on his deathbed. And, and preachers come by and tell him how to be happy when he got to heaven. But he wasn't satisfied with that. He got a hold of the word of God. And he found a promise on the word and he stood on that word and God took that crisis and turned it into a blessing and used him to, there, there are probably more folks know more about the word because of Kenneth Hagin than, than probably anybody in our generation. You know, he, he, he brought faith, the teaching on faith, alive. Am I boring y'all? Mary, can I use you? This little lady here, you've heard Pastor Statham tell this. But Pastor was raised as good as you could hope to be raised. He had a mama. I, I, I knew his mama. I never got to know his daddy. He had a praying mama and a preaching daddy. And he told it himself. He told about how that they was the sideshow in town, that, that people would come and because they didn't have air conditioning in those days, they would look in the windows to watch the fire of God fall in that building. But yet through all that, and pastor, if you're looking on, I would tell this if you was here. <laughs> Through all that, Pastor, some way, lost out with God. 
but there was a crisis that come in their life, and, and, and they kind of rehearsed that during this last week or two. When Pastor was going someplace, and a little, a little Volkswagen bug that you were driving, and this car is so squashed up that Pastor didn't even recognize the car. The ambulance had already gone, and, and Mary was so crushed up, and, and both kids were in the car with you too, but he saw one of Pam's toys. He's there at the wreck and realizes that's his family. And the people at the wreck said, oh, the, the woman is dead. So pastor left that scene to go to the hospital expecting to find a dead woman. But God in his mercy. <laughs> that's right. But God. Everybody said that with me. But God. So then the report went on, and, and, and Mary's, they said that her ankles were so as if they had taken a hammer and smashed them, and the doctor said she will never walk. Pastor's backslid, losses, a ball, and high weeds. If you don't know what that means, he wasn't saved. <clears throat> but this little church had a continual prayer vigil where Mary had been going for that lady. So when he gets out, this is all pastor told me. He said, let's go down to that little church. And, and, and so they come and they, they sit toward the back. And the man, now Mary always was serving God. Pastor wasn't serving God. But the Lord told him, he said, let me take you up front, honey. She said, no, I don't want to go. I don't, she didn't, that's his term. I, I don't be an option. I don't make a spectacle. I don't want to make a scene. No, I believe, I believe, Pastor, as a lost man, I believe a crisis. If I take you up there, that God will heal you. So he picks Mary up and carries her up and sets her on the altar. And but God healed her body. And because of healing that body, it made such an impact in Pastor Stadium's life, that that crisis turned into a blessing to hundreds of thousands of people around the world. But it started through a crisis in Mary's life. I was looking on Facebook this morning. I, 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 if I'm too personal for y'all, I hate that for you. <laughs> but. But when I started out the door, now, now again, I've already, I've already, you know, God, it seemed like I wrote that down. God, in my crisis, I believe is what I, what I put down there. But uh, anyways, I, I look on Facebook and there's Kathy back there that, that put the words up right there. Kathy said, uh, to yesterday, was it yesterday or today, Kathy? Today. Yesterday. yesterday. Nine years ago, yesterday. A crisis. She's in a car wreck. How many know car wrecks is not good? But in the car wreck, she didn't know there was anything wrong with her. But because of the crisis of a car wreck, she finds out that she's got cancer that would have taken her out except for this car wreck exposed what it is and now she's alive and cancer free today because of a crisis. Well, can I just keep bringing it over here? How, how many else in here has had a crisis that turned something good for you? Amen. Well, right there, I'm, 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 I asked, the only one I asked could I use this was Suzanne. But you talk about raising things up out of the ashes. <laughs> you, you've heard her testimony. How many would agree that ordinarily when your house burns down and everything that's in your house burns up with it, that would not be a good thing? Would you call that a crisis? Well, Suzanne experienced that kind of crisis. But the good thing was she got out. There was no loss of life. And by the way, it was your neighbor's house that caught on fire that caught your house on fire, right? It was no fault of theirs. But nonetheless, we're faced with a crisis. But through that crisis, that house that they were struggling to pay for, she has a nicer house 
that is paid for. And by the way, we didn't get to tell, tell it that. But then she had that piece of ground that the enemy fought every way that there was to fight. But it's been sold now. So that crisis turned in to a triumph. What I'm trying to tell you, church, is whatever it is that you're going through, your crisis can be turned into a triumph. God didn't give up when you're going through a hard place. <clears throat> I shared this Wednesday night with my class up there. And by the way, I want to really encourage you all. If you aren't coming to Wednesday night, you're missing out. The presence of the Lord is, and I don't understand why he does. I'll give you, for example, Wednesday, Tuesday. I don't know. I'm going to tell it anyhow. My grandson's birthday was, was uh, the second. So on the first, my son had a, had a trip going to Indiana. And my grandson had finally come to the place he, on the Saturday. He said, Papa, I want out. I, I want out of this culture that I'm in, and I'm ready to go to rehab. He said that. Well, I called on Sunday, and I found out that there was a bed open at True Purpose for Carl. And by the way, Carl had just celebrated his four-year crisis. He, he, you know, he, he, he's four years clean, four years. Now he, he's in ministry now. He's pursuing his minister's license and starting a ministry up in Indiana. So, 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 but it was a crisis that, that brought all that place that. Well, so, so Petey and I go up on uh, Clinton Highway to meet my son and, and, uh, and Bevan to have his birthday celebration a day early before he goes off to rehab. <clears throat> and, but in our heart, we're rejoicing because he's going to rehab. Well, in the process of doing drugs, you do, you do everybody wrong. When I do prison ministry, most everybody's in prison. Almost all of them had something to do with drugs. If it's murder, it had something to do with drugs. If it's theft, it had something to do with Keith, am I telling the truth? I, I, I mean, in, in, in your little city here called in Lord City in Loudoun County, 95% of what goes on has something to do with drugs. Well, so Bevan's daddy, David, my son, is mad at his son. So we walk in the Golden Corral. Bevan come in last, and David turned his back on him. Well, you know, it occurred to me to knock him out. <laughs> but I didn't. I thought it, it, this this settle down. So we go in, we sit down, say the blessing over food. Surely that fix it. But Bevan sitting here, and Davy sitting here, I'm sitting here, and Peggy sitting there. And and so everybody's eating. So Davy went up and get another plate, and Bevan said it's going to be a long trip to Indiana with him acting like that. I said, I don't worry, I'll get that straightened up. You know, I think I can fix everything. <laughs> so Bevan goes up to get food. I said, Dave, you going to be able to handle this? Oh, yeah. He said, I'm just not going to talk to him. I, he said, I got a radio where I can play. I don't have to talk to him. I'd already give him the money for the rehab place. I said, give me back the check. I said, there's too much riding on this for some petty feelings to get in the way here. So it's 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm... 12 days or whatever it is into my knee surgery. And I told, I called my daughter Robin. I said, can you come and get your mama? And I'm driving Petey's car, not mine. And I was, I'm taking Bevan. Because the most thing, I would have rode a horse to get him to that rehab. It's a crisis. Three of his close friends has died with overdoses. And some way, God in his mercy had spared my grandson. So I thought, he's got to go. We got, we, we, we got to go. So we did it in that car. And, and, and I drove him, and I got him up there at 9.30. Got him settled down in, in room by 10 o'clock. And I'm just rejoicing, praise God. And I got a doctor appointment the next day at noon. So I turn around and drive straight back home. And I got home, well, not straight. I took a couple naps along the way right there. But I got home the next morning at 9.20 and kept my doctor's appointment. And 
studied a little bit that day and take a nap and, 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 but it would just rush, rush, rush but I was just so in, built up in my spirit thinking praise God, Lord, you've come through me and when I got up to teach and, and, and the music was good the people worshipped in, in, the, in the Wednesday night service and just when I started to get up my phone chirped and I looked down and it's Carl Carl had taken Bevan to a church service and he said uh, <clears throat> Bevan has disappeared now I'm fixing to get up to teach and I thought Lord what are we going to do and I laid my phone down on that pew that didn't cross my mind the anointing of the Lord was so uh, class that was there did we have a class Wednesday night the presence of the Lord was, was so powerful and I looked over when I got ready to pray and I saw my phone land and I remembered and we prayed for Bevan well you say, well, now, now, how are you going to put a good turn on that? But he didn't like what was going on at that house. He found out that, and, and here again, that's, that's what they do, and they do a great job. But he found out he's going to have to sit there for maybe six months with not even having a job. He, he, you know, he decided he'd be better off. But, but that day, that night, well, Bevan, he's a survivor. He, he, he walked up to somebody in, in, in Arby's and explained that he was in a bad situation. He didn't have no money. I mean, I... He had no money, and there wasn't nobody for him to borrow any money from. But he went to a guy, and, and, and he talked, the Lord evidently led him right to a recovering alcoholic and told him his story, and that guy took him and paid $80 for a room for Bevan to stay in that night. He called me next, said, Paul said, you're going to have to come and get me. That ain't going to happen, son. He, he said, what, what do you think I'm supposed to do? I said, you can suck it up and go over and cry and beg for mercy. He said, well, how, how about if I get a job? I said, you burning daylight. You need to be going and getting a job. That's what you're going to do. Get on out there. And, well, long story short, he went across the street, applied at one place. That guy didn't have anything, but he hooked him up. He likes tree trimming business, so he got a tree trimming job. And, and the guy that hired him on the phone without even seeing him, he said, I'll hire you on one condition, is that you go to church with me on Sunday. I, I, I'm talking about crises. I, I, this, this happened to be my crisis. But anyways, th this is a text I got from Evan this morning. It said, the first time in a long time I'm tithing this morning, I feel thankful for the blessing that I've had in the short time I've been up here. <laughs> so in the crisis... God has turned it around, and, and he's standing on his own. Too. Papa's not covering it. He, he, you know, so, so I just want to try to encourage you. Has, has anybody had a crisis? I, I, want, I want to cover one more. Has, have you ever lost a job and you thought your world was coming to end because that, that job, I mean. But then only to find out that God only had something better in mind. It, 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 yeah, De Dennis his story, that's when you got the job, when you wound up going to UPS, right? Lost the job, then wound up. God, sometimes what looks like a crisis is just God. I, I'm not saying God forms a crisis, but he at least allows them. So if you're in a crisis, instead of thinking, poor old me, you need to be looking around, whoa, whoa. things have been, because if you get comfortable in your crisis, as long as they, they were down there 400 years and they were comfortable. You ever known anybody comfortable in a crisis? Well, if you're not praying, if you're not asking God to move you from point A to point B, if you're not looking for God to do something in a minute, you must be comfortable in your crisis. I, I'm going to tell you one thing. I, 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 you, you know, Suzanne, when her crisis started to rise up, She'll be texting me on the phone and we'll be putting it on the prayer line. Because I mean, no prayer, old fashioned prayer, it changes things. Well, in a, I'm, I'm going to throw one more in there. I, I look back there at Nina. Alan, my son in the Lord, had the most, well, I, I won't say had the most, Jerry Upton had the most promise of anybody ever seen out of prison. You know, when Jerry, but Jerry was an incredible man of God before he ever went to prison 
and, and we visited him several times in prison, and I'm telling you, he was in charge. He was so powerful in Arkansas that the war, or the chaplain shut his services down. He said, because you could start a riot. But, but, but even there, when he moved into Petersburg, if I was sitting there talking to Jerry, somebody said, I, got, I finished my assignment. I, I, I got that, and, and I, I'm, you know, they were just coming and reporting him as if he was the pastor because he was. And, and, and you'd have to understand this about prison. I heard it, moment, they, they called him, the guards called Jerry Mr. Epton. They called him Mr. Epton. And, and, but next to him, Alan Ganey was the most, the greatest potential that I've, in my 12 years of ministry in prison, he, he was the most, had the greatest potential anybody ever seen. And, and, and you're all going to find this out. I'm not spreading rumors. I'm telling you the truth. I'm going to see Alan tonight. Alan got out and for about two years was incredible. Down at the place where he worked, all you had to do, if, if, if you'd want a job down there, I could say, Alan, Dustin needs a job. And, and you'd have a job that week. Called Alan had that kind of pull down there. He got a guy uh, uh, that was wearing an ankle bracelet, a sex offender, ankle, in case you don't know it, had to wear an ankle bracelet because Alan recommended him. That was something that happened many years ago, and, and, and the guy paid his time for that, and, but he still had to wear that ankle bracelet. Alan got him a job. And then he had a crew of about 15 guys that would come here on Saturday and play basketball. And I said in the, in the, the, the Bible lesson that, that he would lead him in. He was incredible with what he did. But Alan got a call from one of his buddies that had been in prison that was in a mess. That had went back in. That was Eddie, who also came here. And he was in drugs and prostitution and, and stuff. And Alan went to the place to pick him up. There wasn't nothing wrong with what he did. It was just maybe he wasn't ready for that. But that one trip back to the devil's house whetted an appetite back down inside of Alan that has led him on a, a path of destruction and Alan has been offered a deal right now 17 years a flea barter there on him 17 years in prison now I think it'll come down some from that but out of his own mouth he said I'm in Blunt County Jail but I'm good with that he said, I have already repented. I know the road that I was on was headed for nowhere. And I just want to do whatever God wants me to do. What's that? That's a crisis that's turned. And he turned the right way. When he got to that turn, you know, he could have hated God. He could have cursed God. But instead he called on God. And I will get to see him tonight. Anybody else? Are you thinking about a crisis you've had in your own life? Would it be a? I'll, I'll tell you another crisis. I, I've told y'all in big families, and I've got a fairly big family. I'm one of fourteen. Uh, my next older sister was. They pair off. Joyce and Wendell was pair. You know, Chick and Bill. I mean, Gene and Bill were paired off, and the other half of my pair was my next older sister. And I, too, I, I didn't have the depth that Brother Stadium did, but I, too, had knew some knowledge of the Lord in my upbringing. And it was at the crisis of my sister going home at a very early age. In, in the funeral home that burned down down in Loudoun, sitting beside my sister's casket, that was a crisis for me. That's where I decided I would follow Jesus. And from that day to this day, I have continued to do that so whatever your crisis is it's just temporary <laughs> I said it's just temporary heaven is eternal